Children learn more from what we are than what we teach, and it's much easier to build strong children than repair broken men. In this journey of parenting, you don't have to be alone. Join us at Desa School of Parenting and enjoy access to sound biblical principles on raising godly children. Learn from others' experiences, their joys and mistakes. Network and interact with other parents as you hone the skills for effective and successful parenting. Please, Please enjoy, enjoy as you listen, listen to, to this, this message. message. So before we go straight into introducing the panelists, I want to give a layout, a brief layout about what we are doing today and what the conference is all about. Um, this is like, uh, we've held this program for over five years or thereabouts, about 10 years running. So, uh, and it's an opportunity to come together, parents and teenagers alike and young adults, and then discuss some of the issues the parenting and relationship issues between these people. So uh, as, as a form of a brief, I will take us through this, that life is in phases and men are in sizes. So as parents, we need to relate with the developmental phases in the lives of our children in order to effectively connect and relate with them. Every phase of a child's development comes with its own fulfillment and challenges. From infancy, to childhood, children are mostly compliant, though they, they ask a lot of probing questions and try to negotiate uh, their ways out of trouble. By the time they, they are pre-teenagers, they begin to question the status quo and ask the what, where, and why questions, thereby trying to question most of the things they have learned, including those taught by their parents and push bound to take on the authorities, whether at home, at school, or the society at large. That may account for the reasons why undergraduates are more likely to protest or engage in riots for any reason than trade unions. When teenagers and young adults engage their parents and question some old beliefs and values, the parents resist the line of questions and the teenagers and young adults do not understand the reason for such resistance. Most parents find comfort holding on to old habits and beliefs and resist change or any child, or any child challenging their authority in court. They equate explanation as rebellion. And when the child is asking for an explanation, they raise up their defenses and most times go on the offensive. In an attempt to, by parents to crush, to crush the so-called rebellion before it escalates, a crack develops in the relationship between the teenagers, the young adults, and their parents. This crack may appear to be obvious at the beginning. However, there is no inter, uh, However, if there is no intervention, if there is no intervention quickly to mend the crack, it, it begins to widen. It may become a crater and then a gulf and destroy the communication channels between the two. The aim of the School of Parenting in organizing this conference is to help parents and teenagers slash young adults navigate this period and make the best of it. Parents should learn how to respect the views of young adults and guide them when they are wrong. The rate of suicide and attempted suicide and depression amongst teenagers and young adults is on the rise. The lines of communication between parents and their and these teenagers and, not, and young adults is strained, if not yet broken, in many families. This experience becomes frustrating for all parties. At this conference, we'll discuss the different areas that bring about strains in, in parents and teenage young adult relationship and suggest ways to make this relationship more robust. By the end of the program, we intend to ignite key relationship elements, such as love and mutual respect between the parties, so as to close relationship gaps and mend bridges where huge gaps existed and to lay a platform for a cordial parent and Teenage, teenage young relationship, which will transcend this phase. Of course, as Christians organizing this uh, conference, 
We also depend and we're calling on the help of God for this to happen. And then we are also going to have a quick session whereby prayers will be made and each party, those that need to forgive will forgive and those that need to accept love will accept love. So with that, I, understand, I want to believe that we've gotten the background and the frame of what this conference is about. So another way we are taking this conference is that um, we're not going to have a speaker or, or, uh, or so, but we are going to have panelists. And in this panel, Today, we have decided to give more room to the young people and teenagers so that they can, we can hear more from them. So we have four teenage uh, panelists and then teenager and young representing the teenagers. And then we have two to represent the parents. So two to represent the parents. So I'll be introducing the teenager, the teenagers and young adults on the panel, as well as, as, um, as, as well as the parents as well, representing the parents. So um, in no particular order, although I'll be, I'll, be say, I'll be calling out on the young people first, I would like to introduce on the panel, we have on the panel, um, Titi Lola, Titi Lola Olua Adebayo. She's, um, she's a 20 year old law graduate from the University of Nottingham, UK. She's the third of four children, of four children by Mr. and Mrs. Adebayo. She enjoys volunteering and using her skills to help others where possible. And she's also passionate about the rights and care of children across, uh, especially children across Africa. Titi, can you say, just uh, say hi, so everybody just gets to know who Titi is. Okay. Okay, we get to know who it is as we move on. So the, the next panelist I'll be introducing is uh, we have on board uh, Amara Owantame Amenike. He's 15. He's, uh, he's currently an SS2 science student of the Redeemers High School here in Lagos. Um, he has hobbies. His hobbies mainly in mathematics and chess. He's also a middle child. He has... Um, four other siblings, and he's a son to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Owanta, members of the School of Parenting. Then, um, next on the list, I'll be calling, uh, I'll be introducing Toby Ogumekon, Ms. Toby Ogumekon. Um, she's, also, she's a final year student, undergraduate student of law at the mm -hmm. University of Essex. She's the first child of her parents, uh, she has a younger brother who is 18, so she's really here to represent the young people. And she's also she's a born again. Good morning, everyone. Um, last but not the least of our uh, of our young students studying communications, media, and film, and he's, he's in his third year at the University of Windsor. He's passionate about community building and leadership. Uh, he's a creative and has experience in photography, videography, event planning, art distribution, charity work, and student govern governance. So uh, that, these are our, our young panelists, our young people representing. They are here to represent and to speak the voice of the teenagers out there. So the experiences they'll be sharing are not necessarily theirs, but they're going to try and represent their team widely, you know. So, um, and on the parent side of the panel, we have two people, two strong members of the School of Parenting. Uh, we have here, Mrs. Tola Oguleye. She's a woman with a great passion for parenting. She enjoys sharing with couples about raising children in, to become godly and responsible adults. Uh, she's happily married for up to about 19 years now. And she and her husband are raising two teenage boys. Um, last but not the least, or, or the other parent we have here, Mr. Dayo Adebayo. He is um, a loving husband of BC Adebayo and a doting father of three wonderful adults and a sweet teenager. So he really has experience in this field. Um, he's, um, 
is, is currently the dean of the School of Parenting. Uh, that's at the Desa School of um, Direction. Okay, so I, let me introduce my humble self. I'm the moderator today. My name is Nanji Ajayi. <laughs> okay, I'm also a member of the School of Parenting. I work as the registrar, currently as registrar of the School of Parenting. Uh, I have three children, uh, one teenager who is 15 and uh, a preteen who is 10, and um, a very, very active five-year-old who is always asking all sorts of questions. So I'll be guiding the discussion, I'll be moderating the sessions, you know, today. So I'll be kind of like the referee. So uh, with that, with, without further ado, I will go into these questions. So you're all welcome on board. I would like to use this time to ask mm. that um, uh, we re have, remind our friends who are supposed to, to have joined in to quickly join in on the program. So for us to understand who is um, on the panel, uh, for the young people, we are going to call them by name, first name basis, and for the parents, when referring to them, we will be calling them uh, Mr. Adebayo or Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Um, Oguleye. So, to kickstart the session, um, I will be posing some questions because the four teenagers are, are, are four different people with, very, with varying experiences. Sometimes I may throw the same question um, more than once, so I will hear different views. So, um, so I'll, I'll I'll put this question across uh, to Kevin. Kevin, so do you do you observe a gap between parents and teenagers? If yes, what are the probable causes? You know, today's program is mind the gap. So, do you observe a gap between parents and teenagers? And if yes. What are the probable causes? Hey guys, um, so yes, I do believe that there is a gap between parents and children in like times like this. And I do believe that one of the main causes why there's a very significant gap is because um, parents and children don't have a relationship more than being parents and children. I feel like if there was like a system where um, parents are more like friends to their kids, I feel like that gap wouldn't be as strong as it is like right now because you are more than just being the mom or being the dad to that child. You are that person's friend, so they can always come to you to speak to you whenever they have like anything bothering them, things like that. So I do believe that that is one of the reasons why there is like a very significant gap because parents just want to be parents and guardians and things like that, but don't want to be more than what being, they don't want to be more than being parents to their kids. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll call on, on Toby, Miss Toby. Toby Ogumekon, can you, um, uh, the same question. I want to hear your views on that. Do you observe a gap between parents and teenagers? Um, and if yes, or what are the co are probable causes? Personally, I do feel like there's a gap between parents and teenagers because um, teen, the, because of the generational difference. So parents are more like um, used to the used to the way they've been brought up and the way things were in, back in their teenagers, while teenagers are more like the the years are progressing. So um, they're going with time while parents, some parents are still stuck on their um, uncomfortable with the ways that they parent, that they were parented back in their days. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Adebayo, can you just say a brief on that? Can you use a second or like five minutes, five seconds to just say a bit of why, what are the possible causes of a gap between parents and teenagers? Want to hear a parental view, please. Yeah, thank you very much, um, moderator. Obviously, I mean, the gaps are there, but um, one of the reasons I can adduce for this is denial on the part of parents. You see, you have a child, you watch the child from being an infant, becomes a toddler right before your eyes and the child matures, becomes a teenager, 
then it becomes you know a young adult. Just then the child now wants to take a different path from you, or the child has different views from you, then you become threatened. You know, because this child has been compliant all through his life. I mean, when he was in infancy, anything you say, the child will do, gladly do. When he was a toddler, your words were law. But you've forgotten that we send these children to school, you know, to learn, to improve their IQ. You know? But when they now learn, and when they can reason, you know, just as you are, sometimes their opinion are better than yours. So when they give that opinion, or they give a different reasoning to yours, their parents become threatened. You know, they don't want to hear, you want to shut them down, you know, and that creates communication gap. So next time they want to talk, or when, next time when they should talk, they will just, you know, keep quiet, you know, and before you know it, you know, parents and people begin to drift apart. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that um, insight. Okay, so uh, I'll move on to the next point. Uh, it says here that um, the lockdown caused by the pandemic revealed the depth of our relationship with our children or parents. Um, so I would like to hear from both sides as well. You know, we are still well, we are not totally out of the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, and quite a number of people had to be in the same room, I mean, the same house for a long period with their children without having to leave the house at all in some cases. Um, somebody likened it to um, uh, the, the Noah and the Ark when he had to be somewhere with, I mean, with the same family in the same place. So uh, I would like to first call on uh, Mrs. Tola Ogule. I also get to the, I would still get to ask the views of, the, of our young people in the house. Mrs. Tola Ogule, how was the lockdown, the pandemic? How, did, it reveal, was there, did it reveal the depths of your relationship with your children? Um, or, I mean, as parents, what's, what was your own experience and what can you also uh, get from other people's experience during this lockdown? In a brief, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my experience during the lockdown was actually an eye opener for me because um, I found out that I thought I knew my kids to an extent. And because we were all in close proximity, before lockdown, they had, if I'm going to put it like their life, there was a structure, there was a routine. And as you said, because we are all locked together in a place, I found that there are some things that my, about my kids, my children that I didn't know about. And at this time, now, the area I'm going to talk about is um, their personality, the good side, especially right now. I found the, I found out that my kids had grown in, the, in their personality, how they think, how they do things. So the, the lockdown was a time for me to actually observe them, study each child and found out, oh, this is your area of strength. These are your area of weaknesses. And we have the time to talk with my husband and encourage them in those areas. So lockdown brought us together. There was more time. So I could actually study each child. The other part was also, I found out that there are some things they didn't know that had taken for granted. And during the conversation, I was like, ah, you guys didn't know this. And I was so shocked that I thought I had passed across to them. And I have two boys. They all have different personality. They have different traits. I also found out that like my first son, I could tell him do this. And he gets it immediately. But the second one, I had to, I had to find out that I can't just tell him do this. I have to go into more explanation why you have to get this done. So I learned also not to generalize. I had to take each child and be specific. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that exposure. I'll call on um, Amara to Amara wants to also give us um, the experience of what the lockdown revealed. You know, it might be yours, it might be what other people also had uh, to share. So I want to hear your view, please. We'd um, like to okay. hear your view. Good morning, everyone. Um, Go ahead. My view on this point is, yes, according to my family, 
you know, this lockdown yeah. actually gave us a lot of time to, you know, bond more and, you know, look at areas. In fact, during this, this space of the lockdown, we have had some family meetings, you know, where one could <clears throat> talk about some certain issues which maybe they didn't like or, you know, how mom or dad handled the situation and we see how we could get better. And, you know, we have had a lot of time to do games as families, as a family. And, you know, it's just made the bond stronger. That's what this, the experience of the lockdown has been for me. Okay, thank you very much. So from the two views that we have heard so far, it's like a, a positive, a win-win. But we also, let's not take for granted that there are some people that this lockdown, being in the same space for several hours, for several days, brought a lot of frustration frustration because they wish they had uh, like going out was like a way of escape even for the parents the children were on their faces they wanted a break oh i wish there was school to drop the children or where they could go to or how they could go to and quite a number of parents also had to juggle work during that play, during that period while at home you know so the children being at their faces everybody was just you know and then there were some people that that the relationship was just not smooth so it was like, um, like would I say, a, a, a gunpowder was exploded in some in some particular uh, homes. So that's why we are also putting in this uh, uh, meeting. So we, um, some people probably were able to handle it eventually, stick for help eventually, and also realize that the so-called a uh, beautiful relationship, everything perfect, uh, was not all that perfect. So um, we know that nobody really has a perfect relationship. It only gets better by the day. So uh, I will call on Titi. Uh, Titi, do you have anything to add to what the set have said so far concerning the lockdown? I think relationships have evolved over the lockdown between me and my parents. I haven't been at home. At first, it wasn't easy because I got tired of all the phone calls telling me to wear a mask and wash my hands. Like I hadn't seen it before or I didn't know to wash my hands. But I feel like this lockdown, I've seen my parents as individuals, as separate human beings, rather as mommy and daddy, and also as parents. So I've had final exams and I've cried, but I've been at home, but I've known that if I had to do late night or all nighters, I'd call my dad because I knew he was going to be awake working anyway. Or if I had something to cry about, I'll call my mom because she's empathetic as that. So I've learned how to how to see my parents in a different light. I've had a course that was run by my parents. So I've had my parents as lecturers as well, which was interesting because I've seen my parents as teachers, well, in the sense of not being at home. And so I think that parents should use this time, this very crucial time wisely, because I think you see as you see your children in different lights they also see you in different lights as well because they're seeing you work from home or they're seeing you talk to other people on phone that they wouldn't normally hear you do at home so I feel like as you're studying your children just be aware that your children are studying you as well while you're at home okay thank you so much for for, for, for giving us that sharing that perspective I want to believe uh, we can also even beyond the lockdown uh, let's take the gains from it you know uh, somebody said, uh, many of us might not have this again in our lifetime, but then it has, it's an opportunity. Um, a great man once said that never waste a crisis, a good crisis, he said. So even though it's like a crisis, let's look for the, uh, the lemons thrown at us. Let's turn it to lemonade and move on. Okay, so I'll take, uh, in no particular order, we had some questions actually compiled before, and then we also want to, from our question box. So we're looking at this. What would you take, I'll ask a, a young person, what would be your take on parents who display some level of vulnerability and admit their weaknesses rather than displaying uh, bravado to their children, indicating parents can do no wrong, you know? Uh, I would like uh, Kevin to address that. I know Titi has touched a bit on it, like saying she's already seen her parents as individual, not just as parents. So, you know, what, what would it, what's your take? What would be your take? Growing up, you always saw them as a super dad, super mom, who knows everything and can do everything. So uh, what's your perspective? Let's hear from you. Okay, so coming off of what Titi just said, um, I'll say that 
I think that in every like teenager's life, there's a point that you get to that you realize that your parents are actually human beings. Like you grow up thinking that these people are like, you know, they are my parents. So you, you get to this point that you see them as, wow, this person is actually a human being, living their life too, and also having to take care of me. So I feel like to answer your question, seeing your parents like show like levels of like vulnerability and showing their human side, I think for me, I it makes me respect them more because it's like, okay, I do know that, okay, you've been faced with like a situation so that, okay, let's say I do something wrong, for example, and they are faced with the um, responsibility to discipline me or like to do whatever they want to do. And, you know, they might they might take the approach of, oh, um, you have to, they might take the approach of like, they can't do anything wrong that, okay, I messed up and like, that is final. But if they show me that, you know, like mistakes happen, like people make mistakes and things like that. So like when they show that like they can be vulnerable to and they show that they are human side, I feel like it's very respectable and like commendable. So yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um parents. Uh, I mean, I want to hear another point too. You know, not the um i would like uh parents also maybe go wrong and don't and it's like especially in this side of the world and africa we, i don't know if it's all over the world that way quite parents are usually the same all over the world anyway uh they don't want to really admit that they're wrong oh sorry i was wrong so what what's your take on that so you know when parents actually um, took a wrong decision and then oh and they are wrong yeah. and it's glaring that they are wrong even if it's on simple things in, in the house you know sometimes we don't admit that yeah, we're wrong for me personally i'm go going back on what kevin said um it's the same you when you as you grow older you start to see your parents as more like humans so they're not perfect and they're just the same thing like they're the same as us living their lives so in relation to me, like my mum, sometimes if she gets something wrong, she would apologize and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know, or I would do better next time. Same as me, if I do something wrong, I would apologize. And I think it also gives your, um, your child a, or your teenager a sense of trust and they can actually come to you and say, okay, they're not going to dismiss or get angry yeah. sometimes because forgiveness is, um a key teaching as a christian as well so it allows room for forgiveness all right thank you for that so mrs Ogule, please can you speak to why a lot of our parents find it actually a bit difficult to say that um oh i'm sorry i'm wrong i'm you know so why do most parents uh, find that difficult and what would you advise that uh i mean the way forward Okay, like uh, what Kevin and Toby said, um, for her parents, it's actually difficult to say sorry. The reason being because we didn't have an example growing up. I don't think there is anyone here like me growing up. My parents, um, I can I can count how many times they told me they were sorry for what they did, even when they know it. I think it was part of the culture that you don't admit your fault to your child. You just use boldness to try and cover it all. So default parenting that we, you know, we are all on autopilot. If we are not careful, we, we tend to repl replicate what we saw or what we seen ahead of us. So, but because we want to be intentional parents, we want to make sure we have relationship with our children, like what the teen, our younger daughter has said. There is nothing wrong in telling your child you're sorry when you make mistakes. Toby said something about her mom right now because it actually fosters relationship. It actually helps you bring your children closer to you. If it's hard for you to say sorry, we can all learn hard that when we do something wrong, he expects us to confess your fault to one another. And so that can actually help you out. I do that when I make mistakes sometimes. I don't want to do that, but the spirit of God inside me, I know when God is doing something inside me, I say that you need to go and apologize to your son. I see the expression on his face. I see that they are actually happy that you can come back and admit your fault. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So much. And that is and that is one of the reasons why the school of uh, school of parenting was established so that we could uh, have parents come together, a, a forum where parents would come together and learn intentional parenting. Because we know that most of us grew up from um, backgrounds where every parent just did a trial and error thing, whatever they saw somebody doing and all that. Moving on, I want to quickly touch on this. Greeting is uh, it's a normal thing everywhere in the world. And I know from culture to culture, uh, the emphasis on greeting uh, may be differs, but generally greeting is is known everywhere in the world. For instance, greeting basically is every every greeting, as somebody will say, an introduction is an opportunity to demonstrate and res uh, to demonstrate respect for others and to create a favorable impression of yourself to others. So when you greet someone, you acknowledge their presence. You know, so most people do this automatically and barely even notice that they're doing it and it actually opens doors for them. I know as parents, you know, while we're raising children, we keep telling them, oh, great, remember, especially when we're going out, you even rehearse it in the house, rehearse it in the house, in the car before the children finally imbibe it naturally. So greeting. But then we also find out that, um, especially in this generation, I would like to hear from our teens, it may not, as I said, might not really be your experience. You know, we found that uh, a lot of parents, adults especially, complain that um, the young people don't greet, don't like to greet. You know, now everybody's just hiding their faces into gadgets and and what have you. And sometimes they might even be walking uh, on the, alongside with their parents, and somebody is greeting their parents or something like that, and they don't even greet back. So I would like to hear from the from the young people. Uh, I will call on um, on uh, Amara first. Why do you think a lot of young people do not like to um, spontaneously greet people? You know, generally. Okay. Um, well, I would say that people usually my age or even more would wouldn't find it so easy or frequent to be greeting you know is because at this age um just like you said they might find think of you know what what is really the purpose of doing this for example even as i was you know growing up of course yes my parents would you know teach me to always greet who you come across especially if it's one elderly and all but then i used to wonder to myself actually, what's the purpose of greeting? But as I continue to grow up, I found out that, I found out that, you know, it's it's quite important in the sense that it's, it shows respect and it can, it makes people, you know, want to be more friendly with you and actually opens up doors of blessings for you, you know, so that's one of the major importance of greeting. Okay, thank you, um, Amara. So Titi, um, do you agree with what I said, my observation about uh, sometimes quite a young uh, number of young people um, don't really, it doesn't come naturally or come naturally to them to greet. And have you heard some adults or parents complaining that ah, this person does not greet. So what, what's the perspective of the young people? Is it that they are shy or what could be the problem? I feel like it's a fair analysis and I feel like a lot of the time we've attach a lot of negative connotations to greetings. Um, I have no issues greeting people, but then when my dad or my mom is in the background saying, kneel down, kneel down, kneel down, <laughs> then that's when it becomes, I don't know this person, I just want me to kneel down on the floor to greet the person. And as well, we've, we've gotten used to saying hello to the people that we know. Like I can see an adult and say hello. And then that's the only thing the adult remembers about me that, oh, look at this girl, last time she saw me, she said hello. Look at her, she has no manners. And that's just it. Next time I see you, I'm not sure if I should greet you or not, because the last time I greeted you, you were angry. So I feel like parents should try to understand where we're coming from in the sense that it's not that we don't want to greet, we will greet, but I feel like the one time we forget or the one time it's an oversight, that's what you always bring us back to. And so when we see the person again, we look at the person like, okay, I said hello to you last time. I'm really not sure what to say. But we tend not to 
tell us the correct things to do. We just tend us to complain about what we didn't do. And so in that moment, we're stuck in the limbo. We're unsure whether to say hello again or whether to kneel down because we don't know what to do. We really knew what we did wrong the last time we did it, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. So thank you for that perspective. And I'll call on Mr. Debayo to kind of like wrap up this point for us about this issue on greeting and not greeting and what uh, our parents demanding too much, our parents expecting too much to be expect our children to suddenly know all our friends and what is wrong if it is uh, the adults that says that greets even the young person first and stuff like that. So can you just uh, add your views to this, sir? Well, thank you, moderator. I think this greeting issue, I mean, it's, it's going to be very contentious for, 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 for a long time. <laughs> I'm going to say the reason why. Well, greeting is generally accepted in all cultures. And even within our own society, I mean, the Nigerian society, we greet differently. Okay. Now, we send our children to school and they are taught cultures of, you know, the Europeans majorly or the Americans. And now their culture when it comes to greeting is different from ours. So now you raise your children in your own culture to greet, probably nail down if it's a Yoruba culture or prostrate if it's a Yoruba culture. Well, then the child goes to school, is westernized, so to say. And the child says nothing by saying, you know, hello, or good afternoon, Mr. So, 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 so. Then that offends the parents. Oh, no, you don't have, I mean, good, or the, the visitor or something. Oh, you don't have good morals. Oh, you're not well brought up because the person is not lying prostrate on the floor. So, so that, you know, gives us you know, um, something, it's something to look about. I mean, to think about as parents, you know. How this be I settled that, you know, a long time ago with my children, you know, because when we started, you know, we wanted them to do it the very, 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 you know, African way, you know, the Yoruba way. You know, but when we saw that, look, these children, they are, you know, they are being trained in a multicultural manner. We know we can't sustain that. You know, because if you are giving a white man, European, he won't appreciate you to bend down or to prostrate. It's just fine with you saying head. So, you know, we're able to find the middle ground. You know, how do you greet? And that works for, well. Of course, greeting, you have to greet. I mean, that is, that is um, non negotiable. But how you do it, that's the that's the that's the cross of the matter because you go to school you know and you are passing i mean and the children will greet you probably they know you by name or say they say hey good morning mr Deva. and they just wave at you i say if you know ah, you know and they're in school they're in school uniform so you i mean a lot of us we expect those people you know to just prostrate and you see them how many times you want them to prostrate for for teachers for adults for what i think we should just be you know, satisfied and contented with, you know, a little bit of courtesy, you know, and, you know, the, the words of the greeting. So that, that way, I think we have a win-win situation. All right. Thank you All for right. that perspective, sir. <laughs> I'll move on. Teenage girls would ask why their parents seem to be overprotective over them. Over, I think it's too much. I think the prote over protection over them is too much. Why is that? Um, why do you think, from the parents' perspective, they need to understand why we are overly protective, especially when they compare it to their male counterparts, their brothers or thereabouts. So why do parents uh, seem to be overly protected over their over the females? This is Ogule. Okay, the reason is because the female gender is more. Um, the word is they are more vulnerable to things go, uh, going out there. So that is one of the reasons um, parents are more protective of their 
teenage daughters. That's what how not just teenage daughters, daughters in general. They, their emotions, you know, we are very sensitive. Um, we are very sensitive women, females. So that's one of the reasons sometimes we become overprotective. It sh overprotective should not be the word. It should be it should be protective, but not overprotective. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll call on the females on the panel, uh, and I thank, thankfully both females have uh, on the panel have brothers or a brother at least. So um, starting with um, uh, Toby, yeah, do you think uh, the way your parents are parenting you are they all a bit more protective over you than your brother, or or your experience of observation with other maybe cousins, friends around, and complaints you've heard around may not necessarily be your own personal uh experience so you can just uh, put a, sh share your experience on that toby um for me personally with me and my brother my mom likes to um be fair like equal in kind of um the way she protects us because we're both her children so it's not like oh i'm going to be more ever protective over one um protective of one than the other but I have noticed that there are parents who are more um, protective of their daughters than their sons. And this could be due to like the way society is run and how there are a lot of um, um, people out there that are preying on like women, as well as the fact that society views women as more vulnerable, but also the fact um, they sometimes they neglect that men also have like feelings and can be vulnerable. So they suppress that and think, oh, they're, they're men, they don't, they're not as vulnerable as the women, whereas they're just pushing their feelings to the side, even though it, should be, it shouldn't be like that. All right, thank you, Toby. Um, I would like to hear your perspective, uh, Titi. You have brothers as well, and you have another sister, so, um, and then your experience with others, what, what's your observation, Titi? I feel like growing up, it was more obvious because I have two older brothers. But the thing is that you you realize it more as a child because you don't know why they're doing it. But I feel like as you grow older, you begin to understand. It's not intentional per se, but I feel like they, they feel, I don't, I don't know how to put it in words, they feel better when when they can Okay, l let me break it down. So we tend to obviously treat daughter, um, female, like your female children, like, I don't know. I, I'm right. trying to say it without offending anyone, but we do- Go ahead, feel free, open up, open up. We do treat female children um, as, as if they're more fragile than male children. And I do understand where we're coming from. And for me, it's been more, elevated in the sense that I've always followed my older brother everywhere. So we've been to the same secondary school and we've been to the same university at the same time. And I've seen that I have less liberties than they've had. And I do understand why, because I feel like when I left the country, my reins were more relaxed. So I do understand now that it wasn't because they wanted to do it, but they felt that they had to, given the nature of the country I was in. But I feel like once I left the country, once I left home, because I was in boarding school, they didn't necessarily know what I was doing. But it came to a point where they began to trust the fact that the training that they've put in me would be able to sustain me when I, as I've left the house. So I feel like when I was still under that roof, per se, they were more vigilant as to where I was, where I was going and what I was doing, opposed to how they were to my brothers. But I feel like once they began to trust the fact that I wasn't going to do anything contrary to their teachings or contrary to their leadings, then they were more free with what they allowed me to do. Okay, thank you for that. Um, really, uh, for the teenagers listening, um, it, you know, the, the female feel as if they are cocooned, they are blocked, they are caged. Meanwhile, they're young, their brothers are free to roam the streets, do what they want to do and stuff like that is actually born out of love. And as the speakers earlier had said, you know, uh, it's to protect you and all that. And then with this, you know, uh, because uh, so one of them also mentioned that females, the society actually views them as those that they can be easily preyed upon and all that. 
you know. And um, one of them, that will take us into some uh, uh, questions about that has to do maybe with uh, involvement with sex and rape and stuff that we've been hearing in the community. I mean, in the society, you know, we get to hear that, oh, some females were raped, some were even raped to death and stuff. All that happened uh, on social media and we got, and it raised a lot of, uh, um, it made a lot of, brought a lot of attention to, to the situation in social media. That's one of the, also the reasons. Nobody wants their daughters to be victim to that and stuff like that. So before we delve more into that situation, I would like to ask this question. What advice would you have for parents on the best approach to discuss the dangers of premarital sex and involvement in sexual abuse, such as rape and sexual harassment to teenagers and young adults. I would like to, I would like to hear from um, um, both sides in the sense that the truth is a lot of parents don't even bring themselves to even talk about these topics with their children. They just sweep it away and assume everything is fine until issues begin to rise. So um, what advice, as a young person now, I would call on um, Kevin, as a young person, you know, you have grown up with your parents, you've grown up to this age, and there are a lot of things you now know, you know, so even on the topic. So now, what advice, looking back, you know, would you advise other parents uh, generally on how to approach the topic about the dangers of sex, premarital sex, sexual abuse, and stuff like that. How should they go, go about that? So Kevin, give us your take. I am going to get some of the parents as well to give us their take on the topic. So you start. Okay, before I answer this, can I just say something about the previous topic about... Um... That's, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so um, while I was listening to everyone speak, I don't know, like, I felt like I should just say this, that um there was like some people said that okay women are more fragile than guys and i don't think that that's necessarily true i i have a lot of female friends and like i like living with them and like saying everyone everyone coexist i've noticed that you know we're all just the same people we all have our emotions and like the way we deal with things that are different but in, going in terms of how parents train their children and how they are overprotective with their female daughters. I feel like that is like something that's not right because I feel like that overprotectiveness should also be given to guys too because saying that, okay, my daughter is more vulnerable or she can be pretty, like guys too, to an extent need some sort of overprotectiveness because you see the things that happen in the news or you hear stories and you realize that, what caused this is because, oh, they just felt like, oh, they're guys, they can handle themselves or, you know, they can just, like, they'll figure their, their stuff out by themselves. So I feel like that overprotectiveness should be given to both guys and girls because it will help both people when they become adults. So going to um, advice in terms of um, sexual abuse and things like that, I believe that in our culture, there's, how do I put it? The, the phrase, let sleeping dogs lie, it, it has been like normalized that um, every parent now does it, that they let sleeping dogs lie. So it's like, okay, if we don't have the conversation, it probably will not happen. Or like, maybe he doesn't know about it or she doesn't know about it. So I might as well not speak to her about it. But I feel like that is very wrong. We should always you know, create like, you know, like I said at the beginning, about parents being more than parents and being friends and having like a good like real relationship with their children. If a re relationship like that is set, the topics like this one wouldn't be tagged as sensitive because you can easily talk to your child and be like, okay, these are the things that are going on in the world. And you're not training them to be scared of these things or to be afraid. You're telling them that these things exist. I trust that with the trainings we've given you and what you know about being a Christian and being a good person, you know what is right and you know what is wrong. So I believe that if to advise parents that we should always just know that, okay, these things are still going to happen. They're still in the world. So are you going to give, equip your children with what they need to survive 
or are you going to scare them and believe and act like it's not going to happen like that way? So yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kevin. I'll I'll soon call on um, Amara to also share his experience on that and tell us his take. I like one phrase that um, um, uh, Kevin just said now, mentioned now. Are you going to equip your children with the right skills to navigate life, so to speak? You know, let's not just assume. And quite a number of parents will be feeling that oh, it's thoughts insertion. Let I like that one that he also put about the like, sleeping dogs like kind of approach, which is wrong you know so let us be deliberate you know so i'll quickly call on um, amara now to also what's your advice on, for parents you're not advising parents you're representing uh, young teenagers so what's your advice for parents on to best approach the best approach to discuss the dangers of premarital sex involvement in sexual abuse such as rape and sexual harassment and all that so what's your advice amara to parents Okay, um, well, my advice to parents would be, you know, that they should first of all, you know, pray about it. You know, this is something that is very important in your child's life. So it's best to pray about it. And as you are led by the Spirit of God, you know, you go ahead and, you know, take up the topic with your children. But then I would like to say that when you come, when talking to them, you know, I feel when the discussion went on that girls are girls need to be protected more than boys, I actually felt just like Kevin said, it's not necessarily true because it might even be the guys who need to be protected more in the sense that it depends on the type of protection. For the guys, it's that you know they are the ones who are more outgoing, you know. And when we hear cases of social vices, you know, which has to do with the, you know, premarital sex or sex education, you know, we know that it's mostly the guys who went out of their way to, you know, cause this to happen. I mean, look at that. It's because probably their parents hadn't taken up this topic with them and, you know, hadn't sat, you know, that, that's the type of protection that guys need, you know, to be educated on these things. Because if they don't, they are the ones who most likely carry out the thing for the girls is that they need to be educated okay don't you know expose yourself too much in this case which would attract them but for the guys is the guys they they need to be educated so that they don't get moved by certain things which could cause them to you know do things that they will regret that's what i just wanted to say okay thank you so much so i'll go to um Chitola, uh, mrs ogule um what uh, what is uh, still on the same question what's the best approach because quite we still have quite a number of parents that um don't either approach the topic properly or as uh, kevin put it just let sleeping dogs lie you know so what's the best approach for parents to discuss um, these issues sexual issues and all that with their children okay thank you First of all, in school of parenting, we believe that sex education should have started from a very early age, that not when our kids are become teenagers. So that's something I just want to pass across to everyone. Now, parents, um, I'm just going to use myself as an example. It's not easy talking about sex to our children because we weren't taught it was a taboo growing up. I don't think I ever heard my parents or my mother and my father sitting down and telling me about all these things about sex. So as I said earlier, default mode, autopilot, most of us are in it. So it takes a lot. Some of us are shy. It's a topic we just believe that should just go away, that our kids will just learn. But the children we have of these days, it can work for them. They have a lot of things at coming to them compared to our days when we didn't have social media. But now, even they don't want to see it, it's coming on their faces, on their screen. So my approach to parents is we have to start talking. And one of the things I will say is between you and your husband, find out who has the strength, who is more able to talk to your child about this. For me, it's my husband. He can, it's, it's, I know he's stronger in it. We all have strength. 
we all have areas we complement ourselves. So when we both talk about it, I think you have this better than me. And because we have teenage boys, he talks to them more about it. I there, I support. Then another thing I would suggest is we can use um, um, scenarios. We can pick scenarios for them and ask, what do you do in such a case? Or also what is happening around now? You can use it to talk and also ask their opinions to know what they really know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, Mr. Adebayo, I also want your talk on that. And I want you to, uh, your response, Mr. Adebayo, on the issue of parents having a one-on-one -on -one discussion on this, uh, how they can go about this premarital sex courtship and relationship with the opposite sex, because um, those are some of the things that causes jitters in parents. You know, Mr. Debayo, please. Well, thank you very much. I, I think it will be easier for parents, like this. Mr. Gulay said, if we start early, I mean, age appropriate sex education, I mean, then again, uh, I always want to advise that you know, we should learn to create a safe environment for our children thank you. where we keep them away from predators. As, as much as we can. But by the time they grow to teenage years, you know, and um, to young adults, so then the, the education should be more specific. Of course, you'll have started, like I said, since when you were younger. I remember when um, my two sons were living, I mean, they were, they were living to go to university. We had each individually, you know, one of the talk, you know, that I always have with them is this issue, you know, of sex. Yeah, for the men, I not only tell them that, look, don't be involved in this. I mean, don't violate a woman. I also tell them, don't find yourself in a compromising position because they are living for a different society and um, it's going to be your word against a woman, you know? And that person, we, there's going to be a bias, I mean, the, you know, for the woman who says, look, I've been harassed. It's not only even the sex thing. There's sexual harassment. You don't even have to go far to sexual intercourse before you could be found liable of sexual harassment. You know, you could group a woman, somebody could say, you touch me inappropriately. So, so I tell them, look, don't even joke about it. Don't even think about it, you know. Don't even find yourself, you know, in a position that you cannot explain. And again, you know, we, we say the reason and we go over it again and again and again and again, you know. And the same thing, the same thing for my daughter. I mean, yes, you're going out, you know. Don't be too trusting. I mean, and don't find yourself in a vulnerable position, you know, don't get your drinks to be, I mean, spiked. I mean, so we, we have, we play a lot of scenario. Again, I also advise that, you know, we have like, I mean, Mr. Blair said, we have to check moments. You might be driving, you might be talking, you might be watching movies and something just, you know, comes up on this. I mean, then that's a good moment for you to say, oh yeah. I remember the, there was a time, you know, during this lockdown, I was watching a movie, <laughs> and all of a sudden, two guys were kissing each other in the movie. And my daughter, you know, that's the last one with the children that was just beside me. Of course, I know, I mean, these children know, you know, more than you think they know. So she, she wanted to turn her eyes off. I said, mm -mm. you know, so what is that? So we, that night, we talked about lesbianism, we talked about of course, we've talked about it before, but it allowed us again you know, to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, you know. And she said, somebody said, Inyama. I mean, I went to do it, of course, then I felt good. Okay, now we're talking. So, I mean, it's something that should be ongoing. You, know, you begin to reinforce it, you know, as they grow. So these things should be age appropriate. You don't, I mean, it's easier for you to start when they are very young and for the education to get, you know, intense as they mature. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would go on, uh, still building on this uh, kind of topic, kind of. Um, you know, as as our as the as our children grow older, they become young teens, teenagers, and all that. They develop. They have their own attraction towards the next. I mean, opposite sex and all that. And even if they don't develop their own, others are having interest over them. So. Um, a lot of parents uh, find that face also panicky and stuff like that. And they just give rules sometimes. Don't do this, what's the guidance? So I would like to hear from the teenage, from the young people representing the house, in the house now. Um, I would like each of you, I'm going to call on each of you to speak on the topic. Um, what's what's uh, advice, or would I say, how do parents, um, how would you advise both parents and, and your colleagues, teenagers, young people on treading issues like uh, uh, dating, for instance, having friends with the opposite sex, having it safe? And, and how do we convince your parents that if I have a friend, a, a, a male friend as a female, or a female friend as a, as a male, uh, it's just safe friendship and stuff like that? Because parents are quite concerned about uh, that's involvement of premarital sex and all that. I hope you understand my question. So I would start with um, uh, Titi. What's your take on that? Okay, it so might be yours, it might be your friends, you know. Parents are usually, especially on this side of the world, we don't even want to hear that our, our, our children have friends of the opposite sex because to us, the overall thing is we don't want to hear that it could lead to sexual exposure and stuff like that. So. What would you advise? Uh, what, what, what do you say, advise parents as to that and also your colleagues? What's the best way to handle such periods? So, kicking back off the last discussion, I agree with everyone where you say if you're having these conversations for the first time with your teenagers or young adults, then you're probably too late because we've probably already formed our opinions and stances on topics like this. And I believe that sometimes while parents have good intentions, they miss the mark where they say they want to have discussions, but they end up just giving orders and leaving. And they feel like they've had a one-on-one, -on -one, a genuine one-on-one -on -one chat where I just listen to you shout at me and then you walked away. So I believe the best way to go about a true discussion is opening a true discussion or even a debate, depending on the temperament of your child and whether they're open to say what they feel. And so you can ask them opinions about ongoing issues or where they form their present opinions from. You like mentioned before, you can bring on present circumstances and situations. For me, the conversation started, well enough, it, it's happened gradually over the years. I can't pinpoint one particular location, like um, scenario where I was sat down and actually said, oh, this, 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 all in one session. But I remember when I was younger, my parents gave me and my siblings, apart from my younger sister, they gave us a book. I can't remember anything about the book. I only remember that it was a red book titled Sex is Worth Waiting For. I don't even know if my dad remembers this. And so we're all supposed to read the book. And then after he took us out and we discussed it. I can't remember anything about what the book said, like till now, but oddly enough, I remember the topic. So I feel like parents should get to know their children and their style of communication. Because I wasn't always verbal, but I love reading books. And so my parents played on that by giving me books on the topics they wanted me to know about. Because I was going to read anything anyway, I'm that kind of child. I feel like parents are also so, so cautious about the things they tell their children that children sometimes don't want to talk to them about what's in the past. I see questions about crushes, and I feel like it's just a crush. I feel like everyone has this feeling that they are very inevitable. And I feel like once you tell your parents that, oh, I have this feeling, so oh, something weird is going on in my body, I'm feeling tingly about someone. And then you shout at the child, oh, what do you mean? What are you saying? You're lost in, lost in is evil, it's a sin. The next time it's more serious and it's more than a childhood thing. Your child would probably not come and tell you because the last time we were just talking about one boy in your class that's disturbing you, they were shouting at you and now you want to disturb someone you're probably not going to talk to them you're probably going to talk to the friend that listened to you the friend that was like oh there's a crush oh that boy too he was nice to me you're probably going to talk to that friend that was willing to listen to you rather than your parents because you know that 
you know how the conversation is going to go because that's how it's always been. They will shout at you, they'll tell you what they want you to do and then they'll leave without you having a genuine discussion about why you feel this way and the other side of things. So. Thank you, Titi. Um, I would like to call on, um, on Toby too, to give us um, more on the topic, just add more to what they've said and the best way to go about it. Um, I agree with everyone saying that you should start teaching them from an early age, as young as people are saying age four, because children start having questions from as like once they start asking questions, I believe that it's good to start um talking to them about these things because then by the time they're like in year six or um going to secondary school, they already know more than probably what you have tried to tell them. Also, I think um knowing your children's um friends so some parents will be like oh i the children can come up to them and they're like oh i have a crush or or even if i just be a friend i'm like oh no boys no um i don't want to see any way of the opposite anybody of the opposite sex and it's like you, instead of you to get to know the person and also talk have an open discussion with your um children so that you can understand um where they're coming from because feelings are not as a human being feelings are normal you have those you we have hormones in us that actually produce such feelings and you can teach your children you don't have to act on every feeling that you um feel so i think also teaching your children um consent in regards to the topic about sexual abuse and um because it's a very broad topic so teaching your children consent from an early age don't touch people where no matter like depending on the location the attire just keep your hands to yourself also don't put yourself in predicaments where you could be um found wanting as well i also believe that um listen to your children because um statistics show that um a lot of sexual abusers whether it's harassers rapists be like, close like they're usually people that are close to us rather than someone that's on the street that you would just see Daisy, because they listen to your children when they speak, and if they say they feel uncomfortable around a person, be sure, like maybe watch out, like be alert, so that they they feel like they can come and talk to you. As Titi said, you want them, to, you don't want to talk at them, but talk with them. So, um, let them understand why it is like whatever they're doing is wrong, or how they can go about it. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I, 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 I want to believe all the parents logged in are really, really picking a lot of things this young people representing represented here are saying. They're saying a lot of loaded things. Um, so I'll call on Kevin to, to talk about it, add some more stuff on that uh, topic. Um, Kevin. Okay, so um, someone mentioned something about teachable moments. And I feel like that's something that we should be very intentional about in terms of how we speak to like children. Um, I think, for example, um, what was just what Toby just said about teaching consent. Like, there's this video on YouTube that simplifies what consent is to com comparing it to T and something like, oh, um, if your friend says he he or she wants T and she changes her mind, you can't be mad about. How, the person saying that she doesn't want tea again. Like the, the video breaks it down and it makes it very simple. Content like that is all over the internet. I, 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 I can imagine, I can't even imagine how awkward it might be for like a lot of parents to have conversations like this with their children. And, you know, it's, it should be like wrong to dismiss the fact that it is a very, you know, let me put in quotes, a weird topic, right? Um, Mrs. Tara said that um, you like, Parents are not taught this when they were younger too, so they don't even know how to have this conversation in the first place. So I do believe that we should make use of teachable moments and make use of content on the internet. Like when they're young, when kids are younger, like when they're growing up, just once in a while, just like slide it there and just send them things like that. And about the thing about crushes and um, liking people of the opposite sex, I do believe that it's a very normal thing. It's something that happens even while you're preaching. You start to, while puberty starts to start, when puberty starts, you realize that 
you know, you are getting some feelings that you are not sure of, you are not, you don't really understand. So if as a child you come to your parents and the mother dismiss it and act like it's not normal, you are, that child is probably never going to have a conversation like that with their parents again because the parent has already said to the of of you can't we can't have conversations like this or like you are out of line for thinking this way or saying these things to me in the first place. I feel like parents need to kind of like drop their guard down in terms of topics like this and realize that okay if my child coming to me to have this conversation he's not saying it to provoke me or to annoy me he's genuinely he genuinely wants to know who I feel about it. So let's say a twelve year old comes to you and says this is what I'm doing and you dismiss him, he will never come back. But if you create like an environment and say, okay, this is what you should know, this is what you should this is what is right, this is what is wrong. As that child grows, you you realize that you guys will have a relationship that they will always involve you in things that happen in their lives and regarding to things like this. So it all starts with the first time that they they come to you to say, okay, this is what I'm feeling. Are you going to set are you going to create a relationship or an environment that they can always come back to you? Or are you going to, you know, block that contact from the first try? So, yeah, that's what I feel about the issue. Thank you so much for all who have spoken so far. The, the thing I'll bring out of this is that um, our young children, our young adults, our children, as they're growing, taking, uh, navigating life, they actually depend on us parents to guide them. And they, can, they, they see us from the beginning as people that they need to come come to with anything that is boggling them. Like I said, I have a five-year-old that asks me questions as much as, uh, they sound sometimes frustrating, why is the sky blue? Why is, it not, why is it not green and stuff like that? You know, so that's how it starts. You know, so if they're able to come to you with all questions, let's be open as parents. Let's listen, let's not just shout out, oh, where did you hear that from? Oh, you have fire following bad gang, all those kind of things. So they just close up. And as one of the uh, uh, team panelists also mentioned that sometimes even when we deliberately say we are calling them for a talk and we end up with a discussion, so to speak, we end up talking down at them and dishing out instructions. And they are like, okay, they are listening, they finish talking and they just, walk away. So, and then from what has also come up, there's a lot out there on the internet that they have access to, you know, so far we have said that. They have access to that. Now, there's still it's so much. Some are true, some are rubbish. You understand this information overload. Some of these things, are they really real? Are they true? How would you, would you, we, we don't want them to experience everything. You know, we want to guide them against all some of these things and stuff like that and learn from some of these things, you know. So, um, um, moving on, um, I will quickly want to touch on um, suicide, depression. You know, the rate of suicide and depression is on the rise amongst the teenagers and young adults. And many parents fail to see the signs of depression in teenagers or young adults. Why is this so? Why is it so difficult for teenagers and young adults to discuss their challenges and secret battles with their parents? or seek counsel or guidance from their parents. Well, uh, before I throw this out, I really know that um, it's not just about sex, just that we are saying, building relationships, keeping conversation lines open, you know? So a lot of times our parents also feel that what, uh, what could uh, possibly bother our teenagers, that, I mean, they're not the ones paying the deal, they're not, but they also have a lot of pressure. School pressure is a lot of pressure. They are under pressure to, uh, pass their exams, uh, move to the next level and all sorts of things. They are also thinking of how they will navigate life, are they in the right uh, track and stuff like that. So indeed, they also have their own pressure, you know. And so um, it's the same way if we are not open to discussions with them or we just sweep it away. I mean, is that why you're crying? You know, that kind of thing. It's not all the time that we should, as parents, just say, so is that why you're bothered? My friend, my friend, go and sit up and face things, you know? So that is what brings about um, depression and probably ending it all. 
But I would like to, before I allow the panelists to say a few things, I also want to drop the fact that life is precious. Life is really precious. God gave it to us freely and no parent or child should take the selfish decision of ending it all. You know, we may, we may be focusing on, oh, a lot of teenagers are killing themselves. Same way, you know, they had a child, they, were, they nurtured this child, and then that this child is a precious gift to the entire family, and then the child just feels you should just kick it off. The same way we have also seen adults too. I mean, as a child, you wouldn't want your parents to just end his own life like that too. I mean, what do you expect a child to do? So um, what I would like to hear from us, what could be the reason for depression in young people that pushes them down. I would like Amara to start this, uh, say some things about this, get them to the point of, of being in depression or even contemplating suicide. Amara. Uh, okay, praise the Lord. I know that as a young adult or a teenager, some certain things can occur that would, you know, get one so depressed and in the thoughts of, ending it ending one's life could come in but what i want to say to that is that you know if first of all if one is feeling depressed or that sort of thing even if the person doesn't feel bold enough to meet his or her parents at least find an adult who you know he or she trusts well enough to handle such a situation you know, you could go meet, walk up to the person and tell the person that, oh, this is you know, how you felt about so 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 thing. And that, all that, you know, a problem shared is a problem half solved. You know, or one could even, you know, find one's friend, you know, who is really trusted. But when looking out for a friend, you have to be very careful because you know, young people these days and some some young people are not you know who you would go to for those kind of things some could even you know probably maybe advise the person if you if you're, if you're feeling this way why not just you know end it all but st still there are some who could be you know god sent and you know would help that person get out of whatsoever trouble the person is but as for taking one's life you know i i feel that's a no go area you know one of my classmates you know, met me one time i was like <clears throat> that he there was something that occurred and he felt like you know just you know probably just killing himself so he said it jokingly you know but i approached him and i was like that no you don't joke with such things you know you if, if there was something that happened find someone you can talk to you know that was that the advice he gave i gave him and you know, for, and he now said, I think that that was why he was talking to me or something like that. You know, so at least the first thing I advised him, you know, to was that he shouldn't think, you know, towards that area. It's something that shouldn't even be, you know, thought of. And then, and I told him that, you know, you should look at the bright side of bright side of life. You know, there are a lot of good things that come with one's life. There are a lot of blessings, even though one might not, you know, um, it might not be glaring in one's face as the challenges do, but still, you know, there's always, to every dark cloud, there's always a silver lining. That's what I would say concerning oh, this. Thank you so much, Amara, for, for that. Uh, it was a very good one. Uh, and then I also call on, um, on Toby. So what do you think about the spate of uh, suicide and depression amongst uh, young people? And you hear some of them leaving suicide notes, even on social media and ending it all. I mean, what's what's the way? I mean, how do we address that? Um, first and foremost, I think we shouldn't dismiss um, young children or anyone's feelings in no matter like what. If someone says they feel this way, we should try and be understand why they do feel that way because every I can slap someone and then they not see anything about it, but then I slap someone else and then they get angry. So it's different. Um, th it's different things for different people. And also, I think that um, I've learned that suicide is not really a selfish decision because pe some people don't actually, they don't want to commit suicide. It's it just like, uh, it's a thought that just creeps up and it's, it's something that they, 
it's instinct to like this is what I can do they feel like that's how they can save themselves or like they might as well just end it like no one else is there for them they might as well just end it so and also um I had a because I'm in uni now so in my first year of uni I had like a flatmate who lived on the bottom floor we were friends like me and all his friends I had friends that were also friends with him as well so it, we must have I must have come back from the library with my other friends and we went to his room but then the light was like dark and like it was off and he was just under his covers like just sitting there in the room by himself which is very like weird like you wouldn't normally see someone do that and he had like an ipad so normally people you just go on his ipad to like um play games so i went on google i think i was searching something up and then it said how to um I don't know if it said how to hide depression from your friends or like something along the lines of depression. But I'm I was thinking like like why would that be the first thing on the search engine? So um I told his other friend, they've been friends for like 10 years before they came to uni, and then I told his other friend, and then we were both trying to like um speak to him, ask him if anything is wrong. Like it became bad, like sometimes he would just lock himself in the room. And like none of his friends would be able to go in, even his friends that were from 10 years or the ones that he made in uni. So he would always be in his room. Sometimes he would not be there. We used to get, one time at a point we got this school and um, campus security to open, to check if he was in his room to see if he was actually there. I mean, he wasn't there, but he, I think he had gone out, but it's because he hadn't spoken to anyone in like a long time. I mean, and then during the summer, he later like explained what had happened. And I think it's a, as a, if you notice that someone close to you or someone even in general, like as a counselor or someone is going through depression, I think it's it's good to like, let them know that you are there for them. Some, you don't always have to give advice or always have to um, speak and on the situation because so they might not feel the need to talk. And so it's just to, it might just be sitting there with them and just being silent together with that person, understanding like they, they're not in this situation to talk or to express themselves. Also, I think, I mean, depression all comes in all kinds of, um, it could be not eating, it could be eating too much. People smile in your faces and later they're it's crying later. People, um, they they start gaining like um, eating disorders. It just comes in different places. So I think researching is key and also asking people like that you love, like how they are, like oh. just to kind of get to know where like the state of mind that they're at at that point in time i also think that um um depression is one part of mental health but there's different also um parts of mental health for like anxiety bipolar so we need to not dismiss those things and say oh she's just having a another one of her episodes or she's just having another one of her fits or she's just in that sad state that she's always in and try and understand where that person is coming from and also see that make them feel like they actually have a reason to um, make them feel like they're loved, basically. And I also think that um, in if you are going through depression, just if it's not, if you're not speaking to your parents, speak to your friend. If you're not speaking to a trusted friend, speak, go to a counselor. They're legally obliged to, um, to keep everything confidential. They don't have to, um, they don't have to tell anyone anything. And it's it's kind of like just letting everything out them and also they have more knowledge on how to deal with these kind of things so yeah all right thank you so much um before we leave the topic i would like to call um on mr adebayo to um say a few things about this depression issue suicide well thank you Nanji. it's um uh, well it's a secret battle you know, that we face, even both as adults, as young people, there are times we just feel overwhelmed, you know, and like Amara said, you know, it should not be an option, but there are situations we get through, you know, where you just want to close your eyes to this world and wake up in heaven. And the shortest course to doing that is just to commit suicide. So it seems, you know, but the first thing I will advise is that parents themselves, you know, should find emotional balance because you can't help if you are going through 
emotional challenges. Your children can easily pick it. You know, and um, the first thing you should do is for you to help yourself, for you to shake off. The first thing you do is to help yourself to shake that feeling. If you, as a parent, you are having that feeling. And again, around the house, it's always very good, you know, to have a very conducive atmosphere. A situation where a child grows up, seeing the parents fight, nagging, beating each other, dragging each other, you know, you are creating, you know, some deposits, you know, emotional deposits, you know, in the mind of that child, because these things keep on playing back in the mind of that child. And eventually those things might catch up with the child in future. So you want to create a home that the child is loved and where the husband and wife, they exhibit love. I mean, so where the atmosphere is very peaceful. So that helps the child, you know, to have a very good emotional standing growing up. Then again, I also, you know, we advise parents to know the temperament of their children. It's very good because uh, two children will face the same kind of pressure, but the response, you know, will be different. So if you find out that your child is very sensitive and there's a situation that you know that, okay, this is stressful, you know, you want to quickly help that child deal with that situation, you know, as quickly as possible, you know. I, again, it's good for us to be able to, for as parents, to be able to, you know, how would I put it? See when our children are being disturbed, you know, for you to look at their faces and know, ah, no, there's something wrong, you know, with, it, with this child. You know, I remember long ago when our first son, you know, was being bullied. He, for whatever reason, as close as we were, I mean, when we were at that time, and we are still close, he didn't mention it to me. He didn't tell me that he was being bullied in school. But I take him to school every morning, and we have conversation, you know, on the way to school. So on this particular morning, I, I knew he was dressed. I saw him dressed up. But when it was time to go, I didn't see him. I looked all around the house. I didn't see him. So I went outside, looked around the compound, and I saw him in one corner. Then I knew something was wrong. So I said, OK, hey, what's wrong? And he said he didn't feel like going to school. So I said, you know what? I don't feel like going to walk through. So I went upstairs, I removed my jacket, I removed my shirt, I removed my tie. I said, okay, you're not going to school. You're not going to school, I'm not going to walk. So I left him to play for like one hour or two hours or something. Then I called him back, you know, and we opened up this discussion. Then he let me into the fact that, you know, there's this incident that happened in school. You know, as a good boy, he saw, a, 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 I mean, his classmates brought in money to school. They're not supposed to bring money to school. They use tickets to buy the things they need to buy. And they reported to the teacher. And this guy was huge, I mean, and hefty. And the guy said, I'm going to deal with you. And that was the beginning of his challenging class. So he wasn't looking forward to going to school. But I was able to spot it that morning. And by the next day, he told me that don't tell my teacher or don't, but, you know, with wisdom and all this stuff and counseling, I was able to go to his school, we were able to resolve it. And by the time he came back the next day, he told me that, you know, everything had been solved. If I said the guy came to him and hugged him, you know, imagine if I didn't pick it that morning, you know, it could have been, it would have gone on and on, affect his performance in class because he won't be able to concentrate in class and all that stuff. So we should be very vigilant, you know, as parents. And um, finally, on that point, I also want to say, you know, we should help our children to have a very good esteem, self-esteem. I mean, validate them. I, I validate the children a lot, you know. So when you do that, you know, even when things don't seem to work, you know, they will look back and say, if everything is not going to work, at least I help parents, you know, who we are accepting it. And that was what, what happened to the prodigal son. You know, he got, you know, to the lowest head of his life when he left the house. He went with his father's inheritance. You know, his friends betrayed him. He went from eating on table to eating with pigs. You know, 
I mean, it was totally bad for him. But then he recalled something. He recalled his father. He said, look, you know, if I go back to my father, you know, I mean, the way he treated servants, the way he treated me when I was at home, it's going, he had that you know, understanding that he was going to be accepted. You know, and that is a memory band. So we should create a very good you know, memory for our children of ourselves. And that helped him to pull himself because he was at a depressed state at that point in time. He could have committed suicide because he was at the lowest end of his life. But he remembered, look, my father is still standing. So he went back and through, you know, to his thinking, the father received him with open hands. So I think I will stop there for, for now. Yeah. Thank you so much for wrapping that up very nicely. Um, before, I know our time is far spent. Um, we have still a, little, a number of questions that we have, but we will close this uh, session without looking at um, issues around the um, uh, discipline and anger management. Things like why do why do parents why do our parents like shouting at us, you know, yelling at us and all that, and or even want to beat us? And recently, we even heard of a father that um, uh, had to get his, an eighteen-year-old daughter to lie prostrate and then beat her for whatever things she did, you know, and stuff like that. And of course, when things like that are posted on Instagram on 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 uh, internet, you hear comments, varying comments from the North Pole to the South Pole. Yes, he has the right. No, she doesn't have the right and all sorts of stuff like that. You know, but the bottom line is that something indeed went wrong and there probably would have been a better way to address that. I saw this small like a poster somewhere which uh, represents the emotions of a lot of parents, especially when they're parenting teenagers. The state goes like this, um, I'm not your friend. This from a parent. Now, I'm not your friend. I'm your parent. I will stalk you. I will flip out on you. I will lecture you. I will drive you insane. I'll be your worst nightmare and hunt you down when needed, all because I love you. When you understand that, I will know you are a responsible adult. And you will never find someone who loves, prays, cares, and worries about you more than me. That's a parent justifying whatever approach he or she has to uh, parenting her adult, a, a young adult or teenage child, and uh, addressing issues maybe like when anger uh, issues come up or discipline happens. So I would like to hear from our teenagers what, what they feel about that kind of approach, you know, where parents still uh, yell, scream, and then beat where they have to and stuff like that. And also parents on the other side say, my, my teenager actually raised his voice against me and stuff like that. So um, I will start with Titi and then I'll go to Kevin. Uh, what's, uh, how, what's your take on this? You know, how do, how's, what's the best way to uh, settle things amicably in the home? You know, because of course, as, re as human beings, we relate, even outside the home, we relate. There are bound to be differences that will come up. You know, so how do we uh, address that without having to more like step on stone on toes and do things harshly? So, um, who did I call first? Was that Titi I called first? <laughs> I'll call on Titi, then I'll go to Kevin. So, Titi, can you start with that? Well, me, I'd never advise parents to act in the heat of the moment because I feel like a lot of times parents never go back to apologize, and so if we just carry whatever they've done at that point with us about it. If you if you remove parents from if you if you get that with the understanding that that person wasn't a parent, you'd end up being someone that you've taught children's mission driving you mad. These are qualities that you don't want your children to be around, but by virtue of the fact that you gave birth to this person, you are all right for training those characteristics on the child, if that makes sense. So I feel like we should learn to understand the kind of children we are. Because for me, I, growing up, I feel like if you beat me, I wouldn't even care. I'd just go back and be like, mm, whatever. But I feel like every time I got a talking down, you could just say to come here and I'll start crying. Because it wasn't, for me, it wasn't even about disappointing my parents. It was just by the fact that I disappointed myself knowing that my parents were angry about something I'd done. 
yes. to understand your child and the method of discipline will be different for each child. But don't 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 do things in the heat of the moment or with an angry heart. You need to understand where the children are coming from, the actions they're taking. And at the same time, I feel like a discussion should also take place. I don't mean like, oh, like after I finish beating the child, you say sit down. Let me explain to you what I've beat you. But you should try to try to make the child understand the reason why what they've done is wrong and what they can do differently from what they've done. All right, thank you, Titi. So Kevin, I'll call on you on the same topic. I'm sure you are following, you know. Uh, what's your take on parents saying, I'm not your parent, I'm, your, I'm, your, I'm not your friend, I'm your parent, I will stalk you, I'll flip on you, I'll drive you insane until you get to know that, that I, I'm doing all this mm. because I love you. And then issues come up in the house and everybody's shouting and the parent is raising their voices and, boy, and, and, the, and the teenage young adult who is also raising his voice and the parent is feeling insulted and feeling what? You know, those kind of things. So, Kevin. Um, so, um, TJ made a very valid point that I would like to build up of. Um, she said that knowing your child is very helpful. I feel like when you know your child you, and you know their temperaments, how they behave, like their, their characteristics, it will really help with the kind of discipline that will work for them. So I'll use myself as an example. I used to get into a lot of like arguments or like I used to be really stubborn and rebellious. So like there'll be moments that like they just like flip and be like, why did I make that decision or why did I do that? Why and they you know start to you know, like um scold me really you know kind of aggressively. Um, I realized that if, if things like that didn't used to face me, like I would just be like, oh okay, and I'll do it again. But when they maybe take some privileges away from me, for example. Um, they used to ground me a lot. I, I'm a very extroverted person. I like to go out a lot. So when my parents would say, okay, you're not going out for a week and it's summer, like things like that would really, really affect me. So I feel like when you know your child very well and you know like what works for them and you know, you it will help with disciplining them. And I feel like in terms of like um beating children, I I'm not in support of it at all because I feel like in 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 some spaces, a lot of people don't want to accept and admit that it's possible for parents to domestically abuse their kids in terms of how they discipline them. Like I bet we all saw the video of the um the dad that was hitting his um his daughter and told her to push it on the floor and everything. And yeah, like I can understand that okay, there are some times that like some kids will do some things that can push you to that limit. It's not reflections of their parents in the long run. If if things like that are normal and like are normalized in like households and like okay you hit your child or things like that, that child is going to be a reflection of you and eventually will go to the outside world and start to it will be normal to him. He won't see a problem with, you know, maybe hitting somebody or like if someone wrongs him or does something that's like not right to him, like taking that as like um, his own um, decision after. So I do believe that parents need to be more conscious and deliberate with the way they discipline their children and, you know, it will pay off for both parties in the long run. So, yes. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that experience, uh, Kevin. Um, I'll call on Mrs. Sogule to speak on the parents' perspective. You know, that period where we, we, we feel that we have to, I mean, on anger management and, and uh, discipline. So what's, what's your take as a parent, ma'am? Thank you. Um, for me, I agree with what um, Titi and Kevin has said, and one thing, I'm going to use myself as an example, because growing up, as they said, it didn't change me. All those shouting, yelling, doing anything, it took God to change my life. So I got a dose of that growing up, but what has helped me now is I go back to that age, as in when I'm talking to my children now, I go back memory lane, and I know the feeling when I was a teenager and I just tried to flip it that. If, if I, as in, I play two roles, 
my parent and myself as a teenager. I'm the parent and I'm also the teenager. And I look at the feelings, the emotions that come upon me. And I know I don't like it. So that helps me like, uh uh-uh. If you put yourself in your child's shoe, you won't like it. So that helps me to do those things. Then another thing is um, we parents, we need to take a step back. And as I said, study your children. Every child is different. Take a step back and look at what is happening. Sometimes it's our emotions that get in the way because it has to do with our personality. Why will a child do this to me? It's about me now, about you as a parent, not exactly what the child has done. So taking a step back and looking at the situation actually helps us into that. The another thing I'm going to talk about is as we're getting older, Most of us here today, I believe that we are all parents of teenagers, so we have grown in age. Those emotions are not helping us. I found out in my own life, when my children were younger, I could tell them what to do. They were not questioning my authority. Do this, they do it. But now, why? You ask a question, you tell them to do something, why? I tell them the reason, and they're asking me why again. I answer, and they ask me another why. I'm getting upset. Uh -uh, What is it? Then I found out that I get tensed. My, um, I get tense, I get all angry, and the emotions after is not good. Because I'm the one that after I'm like, why am I having a day? Because I've worked myself up. So apart from everything I'm saying, also because of ourselves, so that we can be more healthy and live longer, it's also good to please control our emotions. Thank you. Thank you so much. As uh, in the School of Parenting, I know there's something that uh, even as during faculty meetings, you know, when we're discussing various topics, a lot of uh, ad- the advices that comes up on the floor of our meetings a lot of times is that as parents, choose your battles. It's not everything that is worth shouting for. Choose your battles. What do you think? Is it important? Does it add to this? Uh, or to the overall goal of where you want to take your children to choose your battles and stuff like that. Take it one step at a time. And it's not everything that should come bombarding because sometimes we focus so much on something and it ends up rifting our relationship, you know, with our children, you know. And then there's something, a lot of things have come up in this um, uh, conference. We're already like, uh, it's 10 minutes to one. I would like to go out just to prepare the minds of our panelists uh, panelists, you're going to have like a minute each to give a last, uh, a, like a, a, a parting word, a word of advice. You can go both ways to to parents. This is what you should do. I mean, this is my parting words on how we should improve on relationships. To teenagers, this is how we, we should improve I mean, on relationships. So if you have two for both sides, go ahead. If you just have to speak to one set of people, please go ahead. But I want us to at least have a parting word to, I mean, to, uh, on this topic on how to ensure that, I mean, to promote mending and closing the gap of relationships. So, and um, there's something that came out uh, during this discussion that says, at the long run, children are a reflection of their parents. That's one of what I think Kevin mentioned that, you know, in the home. So, you know, a lot of times we parents, we say, um, uh, do as I say, not do as I do. But at, at the end of the day, really, our children actually do what we do. If you tell your child to and study, you know, or something like that, and or do not be on the uh, uh, on the on the device, social media at a certain time, and you are doing it, you know, you know something like that. They they'll, they'll more likely follow what you are doing than what you are saying, and in, and it applies to a lot of other aspects too. So. Um, I would start, I will go to our young people first, as I would always want to put them first, and as per parting words, advice on what you would want before we leave the conference, what would be your parting words for parents and for teenagers alike and to ensure that we remain the gap. So I'll start with Toby. So Toby, uh, what would be your parting words um, as we round off this conference? Um. For teenagers, I would say your parents are human beings as well. And I would say that you should give them a chance to um, make mistakes and also be accountable for those mistakes. Um, For parents, I would say give your children the opportunity to be open to you 
also learning the temperament and the different personalities um, so that you can have a close bonding relationship. Thank you, Toby. I'll go to Amara next. Amara, so what's your parting words for the conference? Okay, my parting words for this conference is that in all things we do, you know, we should always, you know, this is a Christian meeting. We should always ask God first. There's nothing, you know, too trivial for us to share with the Holy Spirit. You know, from our Bible, we learn that one thing that God loves is to know how his children are doing. You know, that's why he came walking in the garden, his voice came walking in the garden, you know, when Adam and Eve were there. He wanted to see how they were doing, you know. He always he was constantly, you know, being with them and flowed with them, you know. So, you know, God is happy when we share our thoughts with him and he knows how we are doing, you know. So that's very important. We should always speak to the Holy Spirit, you know, about whatsoever challenge you're facing. As a teenager, if it's depression, you can talk to the Holy Spirit. Even as a parent, if it's on how to go about a certain discussion. Okay, it's like we lost him briefly there. So thank you for what you have said so far. Um, so I'll call on um, Kevin next to give us his parting words. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to the school of parenting for setting this up. This was very insightful and helpful. Um, my parting words would be that I just, like I said at the beginning, um, parents need to be very deliberate and, you know, conscious of building relationships more than being just parents and children. We need to create, like, fun, um, environments where your child is your friend. You guys can... You guys can just, you guys can talk more than like, okay, normal like parent to child, you know, conversations. And for the children, um, we all need to like open up eventually. I know that it might be like kind of tricky at the beginning, but like, it's like building blocks. You start small and eventually you get to the goal that like, you eventually want. So like on both sides, we have like a big role to play in building and mending that gap that is there right now. So yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I'll call on Titi. Parting words, parents, parting words to teenagers. Yes, it's basically the same as everyone has said. Parents should know their kids enough to know when there's something wrong. And you should also let your children get to know you as individuals and not just authority figures. And teenagers should open communication channels with your parents because they are really trying, as evidenced by this. And then we should also respect and admit to the fact that sometimes we're actually wrong and our parents do know best sometimes. Thank you so much, Titi. So I'll call on Mrs. Ogule to also to give us parting words for parents and parting words. Okay, um, for teenagers and young adults, please, I want you to know that your parents are not perfect. We are all work in progress. So please remember that and continue to pray for your parents. We all need prayers. Please pray for your parents. If there are areas you see they are not doing well, leave them up before God. In, before God, because God can actually, He does wonders in our lives. And when parents know their children, praise for them. It's also nice. And to parents, please continue to pray for your children. Having said. Everything here, the most important thing is remember that we are custodians. God gave us his children and prayer makes all the difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'll call on the Dean now, the Dean of School of Parenting, Mr. Adebayo, to also give his parting words for the session. Yeah, thank you, moderator. I will align myself with uh, what Mrs. Oguna said to the young people, we are work in progress. We don't know it all. And our children should bear with us and understand with us too. And together, I believe with mutual understanding, we can forge a fantastic partnership. Well, for the parents, uh, I just want to say today, our children are dependent on us. There will be a time when we grow old and we won't be dependent on them. 
not necessarily financially. You might have all the money in the world, but you still need those children. You need them to support you morally. You need them to support you emotionally. You need them to check on you once in a while. So if there are no relationship as they grow up, it will not happen overnight. If you don't maintain the relationship now, moving forward, you find out that your children are not excited coming to see you. And God forbid that you end up in the one who holds people's home. You know, I don't want to check you on you or no one to take care of you. So it should be mutual. We need our children, our children need us. Let's put this partnership and let's pray to God to help us. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Tadibayo. So um, to close the session, we are going to call on Brother Emenike Wanta to pray over the children and the parents and uh, prayer of healing and to uh, bring about a stronger bond um, between parents and children in the full, uh, in, in various homes. So um, Mr. Emenike Wanta, please. Okay. Um, if, we, if we can't get Mr. Emenike on, on the call, I'll call on uh, Brother Dio, I mean, Brother Tunde Biobaku, to, to, do, to say, to do the prayers. <clears throat> In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity for us to discuss issues that we hope will bridge the gap that exists in homes between parents. Father, we thank you that everything has gone well, and that you accept our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that everything that we have learned today will make a positive difference in our homes. We pray, Father, that you will bring about healing in every home where there is hurt. We pray, Father, that you will, you will bring about better understanding where there is conflict. We pray, Father, that you will help us to forge stronger bonds in our homes between parents and children. And we pray that those bonds that we forge or forge better today will stand us in good stead for the future to maintain harmony, to maintain peace, and to maintain cordiality in our homes, even after our children have left our homes. And we pray, Father, that our children will be testimonies of God's goodness and God's faithfulness in our lives. So Amen. shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that, uh, for the prayer session. So I'll be calling on um, Sister Olushola Faithful to quickly um, take us through a few announcements before we close. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to say a big thank you for everyone who joined us this afternoon. I'm sure we all had a good time. Um, we've learned uh, so many things today, and I'm, I know that whatever we have learned, we'll put them to use, especially now to engage with our children and now to engage uh, the parent, the children engaging with their parents as well. Thank you all for joining. I'd also, I'd also like to encourage us to encourage our friends and families to um, be part of this program. It comes up every second. You can also join the parenting community goes on. So um, you don't really have to wait on the second Saturday of every month before you, you discuss whatever issue you're going through or whatever thing you think you need advice on. We are on, on the Telegram platform. Join our parenting com um, um, community there. We want to encourage you to as well to always join us on every second Saturday of every month. Well, um, at this point, I'd like us to share holding on. So please join us to share the grace and fellowship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Lord Christ, Jesus Christ the, love the love of God, God and, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit abide and about with us now, now and forever. forever and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening in. Join us for our next seminar we, we look, look forward, forward to, to welcoming, welcoming you. you.